Hello and welcome to this Blackwell Online Podcast. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is Graham Farmelow, author of The Strangest Man, The Hidden Life of Paul Dirac, Quantum Genius. The name of Paul Dirac is little known outside the world of professional science, certainly less familiar than many of his contemporaries such as Heisenberg, Niels Bohr, Schrodinger and Oppenheimer. Yet Graham Farmelow's book shows that Dirac, a taciturn, possibly autistic man, had no peers among 20th century theoretical physicists, except Einstein himself. Yet you'd be hard pressed to find any public commemoration of him in Bristol, the city where he was born in 1902. I asked Graham what had sparked his own interest in Dirac. My interest in Dirac began when I was, uh, I guess, about 15 years old, when I had a, a, a job selling raffle tickets to the local Liberal Party, and I met purely by chance, a theoretical physicist by the name of John Bendel, actually. Uh, in uh, And he happened to mention on a doorstep in uh, the southeast London town of uh, Alpington uh, that he was a theoretical physicist, uh, and later on that he was very, very enamoured of Paul Dirac. I'd never heard of him. It turned out that uh, John Bendel would qualify as a certifiable Dirac fanatic, totally obsessed with Dirac's work. Uh, I took an interest in this and began to read or try to read Dirac's famous book, The Principles of Quantum Mechanics. That really made me want to be a theoretical physicist. I'd never seen physics written up like that. It's with its tremendous mathematical clarity, its power of its reasoning, the elegance of its arguments. And I went on to become a theoretical physicist, not remotely in that Dirac's league. But it was that encounter on that Orpington doorstep that that led me to my journey towards Dirac. And presumably at that stage, it was Dirac the thinker, the writer, the scientist, rather than Dirac the man the character whom you evoke in the book that you were responding to. Very much so. I knew nothing about Dirac's strangeness, so to speak, the Dirac stories that are so famous in the world of physics uh, until quite a bit later. I might I might have just heard that he was a bit taciturn or something, but I, I really had very little idea of Dirac's personality. But once I became a, a professional theoretical physicist, so to speak, or a theoretical physics student, then you start to be inducted, like everybody else, into these Dirac stories, right, which are just everywhere. People joke about these stories and retell them, sometimes make them up, I suspect. And uh, yes, uh, and that's how I started to glimpse Dirac in his, you know, the, in his fullness, so to speak. And these stories, you you relate a lot of them in the book. And what comes across is that most of them seem not to be apocryphal. The, the story that I confess, when I read about it, I thought, well, this is probably untrue. But now I believe, I, I, I would say with some hesitation, I'm certain it is true uh, that uh, the, the following anecdote, which dates back to the late 1920s when he was giving a talk in the Midwest of the United States of America. He gave the talk, sat down, chair of the uh, seminar or whatever it was, said, uh, Dr. Dirac, would you be prepared to take uh, questions? And Dirac said, yes, of course. Somebody at the back put his uh, hand up and said, uh, wonderful talk, uh, Dr. Dirac. But one thing, I I really didn't understand that uh, equation on the top right hand of the blackboard. And everyone turns, looks at Dirac, says nothing does move. The chair breaks the uh, the ice, so to speak, and turns to him and said, uh, Dr. Dirac, would you like to respond to the, to the question? And Dirac said, matter of factly, it wasn't a question, it was a comment. I He said that at least three times. What, one of his best friends, who also found it difficult to believe, actually asked him point blank whether he did say it, and Dirac said yes, and in each time they deserved it. So you have there someone who is, the best you could say, is literal-minded to a, a comic fault, so to speak, but has absolutely no sense of the kind of wide berth we give each other in conversation, you know. Uh, he has just had no sense of that. Another one, one other uh, story. There are, there are many, many of them where a, a colleague of his, St. John's College, Cambridge, said, uh, oh, it's, a, it's a hot day, isn't it? And Dirac didn't respond, as usual, for about two minutes, three minutes. Another course comes along at the table. And then Dirac turns to him and said, how hot? Now, I get game. When I heard that, I thought, well, that's not even funny. 
It's just bizarre. And if, if you try imagine your way into Dirac's mind, this, this is a, a, perhaps a crass reconstruction of it, but person sitting next to him said, it's a hot day, isn't it? Then the question one would imagine Dirac is saying, well, that's a verifiable, it's a verifiable thing. You can test it. You can have a thermometer. It's, it, it's not a particularly interesting question. So I will simply go back with a, with, with a, with a response. But basically indicating that you measure such a thing with temperature. Again, it's not, it's not particularly funny or a bit perceptive, but that is the, the extraordinary way that Dirac looked at mm. the world. And I conjecture in, in the book, uh, I'm, I must say, I think it's perverse, in my opinion, to argue otherwise, but I suspect that uh, Dirac is, uh, would, would now be uh, someone who would be diagnosed autistic. Take us back to Bristol in 1902 when Dirac was born and tell me a little bit about the kind of family and milieu in which he was raised. Dirac was born Swiss because his father was a, uh, a Swiss citizen, a teacher in a local school, uh, Merchant Venturers, very well endowed school by the Merchant uh, Venturers Association in Bristol. Uh, his mother was Cornish. She, she said, I'm not English, I'm Cornish. They married in uh, the late 1890s and Dirac was their second son. I don't think that they were particularly perceived as a particularly odd family. I, I, I must say I, I can't be absolutely certain of that, but my clear impression was that they were just an ordinary family living in a terrace of houses in a modest suburb of uh, Bristol. He was very, very fine school teacher, very successful in what he did. She, she was a perhaps slightly naive, but uh, good hearted woman, uh, married an exotic Swiss who, she, who she met in the library and there we are. Family eventually became a family with a, comp a completion when they had three children. And it looked, as I say, just like it, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of families at that time. What we hear from Dirac, from the reminiscences he gave when he was uh, just about to turn 60 and then in private later on, was that for him, for his, for his recollection, it was a it was an X rated childhood. I want to stress this is all in Dirac's perception. We have no other accounts of this uh, except for a few comments his mother uh, his his mother made in letters and what have you, which again they're very biased towards, of course, his mother's view. Of course, Dirac's memory was of a tyrannical father, a man very very keen on his children's education, but with no understanding whatever of the need to socialise, to have friends round, you know, to you know, to have a time when you relax and what have you. And in particular, it was the meal times that Dirac recalled were particularly horrendous. And the reason for that was that his father t uh, insisted that his children only spoke to him in French. In fact, I heard one anecdote, published anecdote, where Dirac thought that men spoke French and women spoke English. Extraordinary. But anyway, it turned out, for, for reasons we don't know, that his brother and sister would eat with his mother in the kitchen and that he would sit at the table with his father and that his father would punish any kind of error whatever in his French, a botched subjunctive, a mispronounced word or what have you, by denying Paul, his son, his next request, even if it was as basic as, can I go to the toilet? Or... Cannot, uh, cannot leave the table because Dirac had very bad digestion of that thing. And he, I draw a veil over some of the horrible things that happened at that table. But in particular, Dirac never forgot what he saw as the great brutality of those mealtimes. 